of the four pillars of exercise in my yeah. world, uh, stability, strength, low end aerobic, which I describe really as they talk about it as kind of mitochondrial efficiency mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. high end aerobic, which is peak aerobic capacity mm -hmm. slash anaerobic performance. So anaerobic power, peak aerobic, low end aerobic mitochondrial efficiency, strength, stability of those four, I, for some reason, struggle to make the time yeah. for the peak aerobic in part because I, one, it's the least enjoyable truth. If we're going to be brutally honest, if you're doing it right, it hurts the most. Yeah. It's also no longer as relevant because I don't compete at anything, right? Like exactly. it was, I actually really enjoyed that type of training when I competed because you have to spend time in that energy system and you see the rewards mm -hmm. of, you know, repeating 60 minute, you know, re, re, you know, 60 minutes of repeating two minute intervals or something like that. Yeah. So if we're, if we're really talking about this from the lens of health, maximizing health, the data are unambiguous that VO2 max is highly correlated with longevity in a, in a, in a unlike there are not many variables that are more strongly correlated. Mm -hmm. So, but the levels don't have to be that high, right? We're not, I mean, yeah. Pogacar's VO2 max is probably 85, you know, or it's probably in the eighties at least in terms of uh, milliliters per uh, minute per kilogram. But someone my age to be considered absolutely elite, which means the top 2.5 to 2.7% of the population, which carries with it a five fold reduction in risk to the bottom 25% of the population. Mm -hmm. uh, my VO2 max requirement is about 52, 53 milliliters per minute per kilogram. So the question is, can I use that as the gauge for how much high intensity training I need to do? Basically just enough to make sure I maintain that VO2 max, or do you think about it in a different way? Well, I think about it more, again, the, the bioenergetics, energy, energy systems, right? I think that uh, ultimately, and we know that um, longevity is also high related with mitochondrial function and metabolic health. I think that more and more, and, and, and this is what you see in so many fields in, in, in medicine nowadays, right? That everybody is stumbling upon mitochondria, right? Um, um, and, and so there's an aging process where we lose mitochondrial function. Uh, and there's like a, a sedentary um, a component, right? Where we lose mitochondrial function. Um, I wish that we could have a medication, a pill that you could take it and increase the mitochondrial function because it would increase uh, metabolic health and longevity. But the only medication that we know is exercise, and the medic and within exercise that the right the dose that we see that improves the most and and also is sustainable in the long term, which is another important concept. You know, uh, very high intensity training is not sustainable. Very extreme diets are not su sustainable. If you combine both, it's even worse. And this is what a lot of people are doing together. But you need to have some sustainability. But this is what it, we've seen this, this is important to improve that mitochondrial function. But going back to the, that high intensity, I think is necessary because we also lose glycolytic capacity as we age, and it's important to stimulate it. As you very well said, for all of us who are not competing, I couldn't care less about um, um, being super high intensity uh, because I'm not competing. Uh, but that said, I want to have also my adrenaline rush. You know, so uh, like many people, I, I but how I, much does it feed into it? So for example, if, and I've often thought about this now, as I just want to make sure my zone two is above three Watts per kilo, would I be better off taking that extra training? If I have one additional training session per week, should I make it an additional zone two workout? So then do, I do four now, should I be doing a fifth one or should I be taking that fifth one and doing a VO2 max protocol. And that's, that's what we'll typically prescribe mm -hmm. to our patients is a yeah. four by four protocol of, you know, highest intensity sustained for four minutes, followed by four minutes of recovery, and, and then repeat that four or five, six times. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you put that, when you put a warm up and cool down on either end of that, you know, that's a little over an hour. Um, so you could, would you spend that hour doing that in an effort to make your zone two even better? Yeah. Or would you just do an extra hour of zone two? No, that's a really good question. So what, what I, what I, 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 I agree. I agree that uh, you can, if you have a fifth day, you can convert it into any type of high intensity 
uh, session structured. All right, what I can tell people also, hey, if you're a cyclist or a runner and you, you want to go with your friends, that's your group ride. ride. Yeah, the yeah. group ride. Go ahead and boom, go at it. Or, or, or if you don't have that possibility, what this is my situation, for example, where I, I, I don't have the time to train more than an hour and a half, usually two hours max, right? So what I do almost on every session, I do my zone two, <clears throat> so it's clean, and at the end, that's when I do a very high intensity interval. Right? And tell uh, me the duration. So if you did so, an hour of zone two, yeah. So I do usually, let's say, an hour and a half. Right. So, uh, and, and so you'll and, do an hour and a half of zone two, three or four times a week. Yeah. I try, I try, I shoot for four or five, but okay. all, not have all the time is easy. Uh, but yeah, I shoot for four or five and I try to be strict on that. But let's say that, yeah, the last, uh, um, uh, and I'm fortunate that, you know, I, where I live, you know, like, uh, I live more in a, it's highlands area. And, uh, so you have to go up. So the last part, I just, I just go at it, you know. Uh, sometimes you you find another cyclist and you just compete, you know, to see who's the, the the fastest in that short climb. But I try to do like a good five minute interval, roughly, um, uh, where I really like kind of like I go hard at it, and and and, and then I arrive I arrive home like, whew, man, I I kicked my ass today, or or this kicked my ass today, or or sometimes you try it and you don't have the energy, as I mentioned earlier. Oh my gosh, I can barely move the pedals today. I just <laughs> quit and go home. Uh, but when I feel fresh, you know, um, that's what I, I stimulate that glycolytic system. What we know well too is that, you know, that increases the mitochondrial function. It takes months or years. Increasing the glycolytic system, it takes much, much lo lo uh, 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 less amount of time. You can do that in weeks or months. Uh, and you can just, if you stimulate on a regular base, two days a week, or three days a week uh, at the end of that zone two, that's where you can target both um, energy systems, right? The oxidative mitochondrial system and the glycolytic. And we don't blunt it. We don't. We don't. We don't um, blunt the benefit we had from the zone two if we immediately follow it with the zone no. five. No, because that's done, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's not uh, what it sees. Like if you do same things in the middle, but you don't want to do the reverse order. Yes, and, and you one don't of the want to things start with like, the high intensity. Exactly. One of the things like because you start having all these hormonal responses, and also yeah. you see you have high lactate levels in the blood, and what we know very well is like lactate inhibits lipolysis. So if you have a high interval in the middle or the beginning, and you don't clear lactate very well, you might have high lactate levels for a while, and it's going to inhibit lipolysis, right? Uh, also, another study we have under review. Lactate um, at the autocrine level yeah, decreases uh, the activity of CPT1 and CPT2. So it interferes with the transport of, um, of fatty acids as well. Um, so that's where like, if you do all this, you might change things. You have high cortisol, cortisol anemia as well. And that's an important point. I, I, I'm glad you raised that because I explain this to patients when they say, um, I went out and did a two hour ride today and it showed me that I spent 45 of those minutes, 45 of those 120 minutes were in zone two. So I did 45 minutes of zone two and I say, no, you didn't really do it because you were going up and down and up and down and up exactly. and down. And yeah. so that's not the same as spending 45 minutes in the dedicated uh, energy system. You're right. And if you, I mean, when I look at the training peaks, you know, like you see the, the elite athletes, they're like both power output and heart rate. This is like goes together, incredible, you know? Whereas, yeah, you're right, you're up and down and down, the average might be zone two, but actually you're between oscillating zone one, zone three, zone four all the time. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit Peter Atia, MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.